Andy, thank you for that great presentation on uh, Arvin. Uh, I'd now like to turn our attention to the North Vietnamese with Dr. Pierre Asseline, who is Professor of History and Dwight E. Stanford Chair in U.S. Foreign Relations at San Diego State University. His primary area of expertise is the history of American foreign relations with a focus on East and Southeast Asia and the larger Cold War context. He is the author of several books on Vietnam, including Vietnam's American War, A History. He is co-editor of the forthcoming Cambridge History of the Vietnam War, Volume 3, Endings. He speaks Vietnamese and travels extensively in Vietnam for research. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Pierre Asseline. Uh, it's, it's a real uh, great honor to, to be here. Thank you so very much for making me part of, of, of what's, what's been to this point, a really, really enlightening program. Um, I really want to thank Dave and, and, and Kim for, for all of their hard work and, and you guys for, for showing up to this. It's, it's always great to speak to an engaged and engaging audience. Uh, people always think that, well, French name, I'm working on Vietnam, that grandpa died at Dien Bien Phu. Uh, I'm French Canadian, I'm, I'm not, I'm from Quebec City. And in all honesty, I only got into this because I watched the second Rambo as a kid. Uh, and then I had to go to history class, write about violence in the Western world. Told my teacher that I'd watched this movie where Rambo was killing all these Chinese guys. And I wanted to write a paper on that. And he said, I, I don't think the US fought a war against China. I think that was the Vietnam War. I didn't know about the Vietnam War. And, and it kind of went from, from, from there. And then in college, I had a professor who was Vietnamese who got angry when I told him how cool I thought the war was. And I ended up kind of being pushed by him to learn Vietnamese and look more carefully at, at the Vietnamese perspective. And I've, I've made a career of this. You know, it's been 50 years, right, 50 years and, and as this morning demonstrated, we're still asking the wrong question. We're still obsessed with, with why the US lost. We never ever ask how did Hanoi win? And that's really key, right? We look at World War II, we've got, we've got, we've got a very famous book about, about how the Allies won. But when we look at Vietnam, it's always about why the US lost and what the US could have done different. If we bombed Hanoi in 72, we would have won. Or if we bombed earlier, right? I mean, and all these things are predicated on false assumptions. You know, Hanoi had been evacuated by 72. You know, the idea that, 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 that people will, will remember this and were shocked by it, there, there was no one in Hanoi except people who were there to defend the, the, the city. There are tremendous misconceptions about the war in Vietnam. And, and what I want to do today is, is, is underscore three reasons, I believe, explain why the war turned out the way it did. And, and, and the three reasons focus on specifically what Hanoi did right to prevail over the United States. And prevail it certainly did. Uh, so I've got a PowerPoint. Uh, most of the black and white images are actually from the Hanoi archives, um, including that picture of McCain moments after he got shot down. Uh, now. In terms of, of, of strategy, uh, you know, we, we made the point this morning that, that Greg made that point really, really well, that, that sometimes you can't solve everything by military means. And, and, and it seems to have been an issue that American policymakers uh, 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 really, really had a tough time dealing with. That, that the leadership in Hanoi understood from the very beginning, from the very, very beginning, that this war would not be won by military means alone, that, that, that other fronts would need to be exploited for victory to ensue. Um, and, and just so we're clear, right, from, from the very beginning, from even before American intervention happens in Vietnam, the, the, the leadership in Hanoi knows that, that, that the Americans will intervene before the Americans themselves make the decision to, to intervene. But all along, the objective is to defeat, 
the so-called imperialists and their, and, their, and their lackeys until complete victory. What does victory mean? Victory means three things. Number one, unconditional U.S. disengagement. Number two, collapse of the regime in Saigon. And number three, national reunification under communist governance. Right, so, so this is victory. And this is what the leadership in Hanoi is committed to and will remain committed to until its objectives are met uh, officially in July of 1976. Now, the strategy itself, right, the, the, the strategy espoused by, by, by the leadership, uh, it consists of three modes of struggle. Uh, and there's really nothing revolutionary about this. They've, they, they've used that same strategy to some degree against the French uh, between 46 and, and 54. Uh, and the Algerians perfected the strategy during their own war against, against France in 54, uh, between 1954 and 1962. But it's, it's, it's essentially these, these three modes of struggle. Number one, the military struggle, the central aspect of which is to kill as many as they can of enemy troops. And, and it's not Americans they want to kill. It's South Vietnamese forces they're going after. To the extent that they can, they want to avoid fighting the Americans. The rationale is that if we destroy the Arvin, if we destroy the South Vietnamese military, then the Americans will have nothing to fight for. The Americans are here to support the South Vietnamese regime and its armed forces. So all along, the priority is really to, to, to decimate the ranks of the South Vietnamese forces. And by the way, that strategy is established in 63, two years before the war becomes Americanized. So as early as 63, the goal of Hanoi's military endeavors in the South is to, is to crush the South Vietnamese army, and that goal remains the same even after the U.S. decides to, to intervene. The second aspect of the strategy uh, is, is, what, is what Americans would call winning hearts and minds across the South. For, for, for the leadership in Hanoi, this is the political struggle through which they try to win support, popular support. They try to recruit part partisans and fighters for the National Liberation Front, for the Viet Cong, and they also try to encourage defection amongst Arvin ranks. You know, Andy was talking about Arvin, right, the, best, the bad reputation it has, and, and, and yeah, there were bad people within Arvin, but, but again, don't underestimate the, the really, really effective propaganda campaign that Hanoi waged to get Arvin members to defect, to switch sides. Uh, th th don't, don't underestimate the, the, the really concerted attempts that were made from, from very early on to really critically undermine morale within that organization. And, and again, this was a calculated move by, by Hanoi. Hanoi understood, mostly from its experiences during the war against France, just how much damage you can do using information, disinformation, misinformation to the ranks of, of, of enemy armed forces. And then there was this third leg of, of, of the struggle, the so-called diplomatic front, which I'm going to talk at length about uh, next, uh, at, at length, because I would argue that this is really where Hanoi uh, ends up winning the war against the United States. The diplomatic struggle, I would argue, is really what, what determined the outcome of, of, of the Vietnam War. Speaking of, of, of diplomacy, right? So once more. Very early on, Hanoi recognizes that, that militarily it's no match for the South Vietnamese army, and, and after 65, it's no match whatsoever for the American military. They, they understand it very, very well. They, saw, they also understand that, that, that the, the military outcome will not be based on their own capabilities. They understand that they're very dependent, if not entirely dependent, for their military needs on assistance from socialist countries, specifically the Soviet Union and China. And so, and so to win the war, they, they conclude that, that they really need to globalize, to internationalize their so-called resistance struggle against the United States. Once again, as they had done to some degree against the war with France, but which the Algerians 
had done remarkably well during their own war against, against France, uh, specifically between 1958 and 1962. The diplomacy undertaken by, by Hanoi during the war has got three primary, three core objectives. Number one, secure material assistance, weapons from socialist allies. Number two, secure moral support from so-called progressive forces worldwide, including in the United States, including in the US. And, and that, that's the thing, right? In its diplomacy, Hanoi is always careful to never condemn the US as the enemy. It's American policymakers who are the enemy. The American people love peace, Hanoi tells the Americans themselves, and therefore it tries to co-opt them that way. And then finally, Hanoi will try, and ultimately quite successfully, to mobilize world opinion against the US war to isolate American policymakers and thus increase the pressure on them to desist to unconditionally end the commitment without having to resort to negotiations. And, and this is another element here, that Hanoi never wanted to negotiate with the Americans. They'd done that with the French in 1954. That had only created more problems. It had solved nothing. And so, so under the leadership in Hanoi, as of the time of the American intervention, the, 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 the position is that we don't negotiate. We pursue this war to the bitter end, and we achieve this, this complete, total victory I mentioned earlier. And when you look at, you know, this morning, right, there was this talk about, about you know, the, the, this, this suggestion that oh, the U.S. wasn't allowed to win militarily. By Hanoi's own account, right, a million North Vietnamese Viet Cong soldiers are killed to 58,000 Americans, right? A million dead, right? I mean, militarily, the US did almost everything right in Vietnam. You kill a million enemy soldiers to 58,000, those are not bad numbers, but that's the thing. All of this becoming consequential because Hanoi's diplomacy will, will negate whatever advances Americans made and their allies make on, on, on the battlefield. Look at these images, right? You, you, you've probably seen those images before. Notice anything about each image and what it features? It's women. It's all women. And, 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 and that was part of Hanoi's strategy, right? Hanoi deliberately sends images and, and circulates images featuring women to kind of, again, right, kind of nurture this notion that that, that, well, they're just innocent peasants. They're just, they're just women who want peace, who have to fight the big bad Americans. And, 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 and internationally, that really worked. And, and the US never really developed a narrative to counter this, this narrative endorsed by, by, by Hanoi. You might have seen the, you know, the, the photo of, of the POW, right? That's staged. Women rarely, if ever, participated in, 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 in combat. They rarely, if ever, carried guns. That's another myth about, about the war, which Hanoi itself created and then exploited because it helped it meet its diplomatic purposes. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this individual, Nguyen Thi Bing. She was the, the so-called Viet Cong representative in the Paris peace talks, right? So, so, so relatively young, uh, relatively nice looking, always wore this owl's eye whenever she was giving interviews uh, and, and presented as really the face of the revolutionary struggle in, in, in South Vietnam. As it turns out, everything she says openly, everything she says publicly, has previously been written by a handler who's from Hanoi, who's attached to the Politburo. She has no independence whatsoever. But internationally, people like her. Hanoi knows very well that she can be a good face of the struggle, and that's why she's out there. But again, she, she has no authority whatsoever when it comes to the negotiations themselves. She's a face of the revolution, just as I'll explain in a moment, Ho Chi Minh was a face of, of, of the revolution. Uh, uh, the, the party would eventually acknowledge shortly after the war ends the significant contribution made by the international community. The party understands today, as it did back then, that, that, that ultimately 
uh, uh, this, this struggle for world opinion had a really, really consequential bearing on the ultimate outcome of, of, of the war. While all of this is significant, um, it's critical to understand the role that leadership played. And, and, and once again, right, 50 years, we still don't know who ran the war on, on the other side. We always talk about Ho Chi Minh this, Ho Chi Minh that, right? Even if you know nothing about what's going, what's going on in Hanoi, we all know that Ho Chi Minh dies in 69. The war ends in 75. Who the hell was in charge for those six years? Seriously, no, but you know what I mean, right? We, we, I mean, you know, VMI, right? There's all this stuff about leadership. And, and you know, we talk about Westmoreland and Johnson and Abrams and Nixon. And then when it comes to the other side, we, we haven't even tried to come to an understanding of who those guys were. And, and that's shocking. After 50 years, we still maintain that Ho Chi Minh was running the show. Again, knowing that he wasn't around for technically most of the time that the war lasted. For 50 years, we still assume that Vong and Zap was the military genius be behind everything. Anyone in Hanoi will tell you that during the war, Zap is either abroad or playing the piano. He's not involved in any of this. The guy actually running the war effort is a little known person, a Stalin-like figure by the name of Lei Zuan. He came up in the Burns series. But, but, but again, you know, 50 years, and, and we still write books about the Vietnam War that talk at length about Ho Chi Minh, about Vong and Zap, that never mention this guy who's actually in charge. Lei Zuan is a hardliner. He's really, really hardcore. He hates Ho Chi Minh. He hates Zap even more, and he sidelines them in 1963-1964. Ho Chi Minh and Zap, the heroes of the war against France, are out of the picture by the time the United States intervenes in Vietnam. And again, you can't make any sense of what Hanoi is doing unless you know who Lei Zuan is or who he was. At, at the time, and, and again, you know, trying to figure out why the U.S. lost. It, it, the idea, imagine teaching World War II without explaining to our students who Adolf Hitler was. It, seriously, this is what it amounts to. You know, if, if, if it's important to understand your enemy, I mean, there was a, 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 a miserable failure on the part of Americans then and scholars today to make that, that effort, but, but think about that, right? Pre discussing China without, without addressing Mao, the Soviet Union without Stalin, or uh, World War II without, without Hitler. Lei Zuan spent a lot of time in jail when the French were around, and, 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 and as, as most of the people he surrounds himself with, and they bring that, that jail culture to them when, when, when they take over power in, in Hanoi. From, from, from a very long, from the time of its founding, but especially during the Lais One period, the party will, will put a premium on, on, on discipline, vigilance, and what they call unity of thought within the party and, 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 and within the military. And as disciplined as Americans have always been when they've gone to war, those guys, I would argue, were even more so because it's always been intrinsic to party and military culture. And, and hard as it was for them to fight, that, that discipline always remained because of this constant enforcement of it through political commissars who accompanied military units even when they went down south. This is also key. Under Lay's one, Hanoi exercises absolute control over information in the whole war narrative. Again, right, so, so we all know typical American goes to Vietnam, one year he comes back. It's been 50 years. How many of you knew that if you're a North Vietnamese soldier going to the South, you can't tell your family you're going to the South. It's been 50 years. Most people aren't even aware of the kinds of conditions that North Vietnamese soldiers fought under, including the fact that, first of all, if you're going, you're going for the duration, and perhaps most important, that if you're going, you're not telling your family you're going. All you're allowed to tell your family is that you're going on an important mission the idea is to make them think that you're going overseas and you're going to be safe. So, so that's one way to control the narrative. So as you can imagine, if you can't tell them you're going south, that means you can't write letters home about what's happening in the south. People up north have no idea about what's going on in the south. 
Casualties, they don't get reported until after the war is over. So Tet, right, 40,000 communists killed. Most of those casualties don't get reported in the North until after the war is over. So, you know, the idea that, well, they just kept fighting because it was their country, or Asians don't care about life that much, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the way these guys control information. People in the North thought they were winning that war. People in the North thought that once in a while, yep, Americans would kill a Northern soldier, but for every Northern soldier, 20 Americans would get killed. It was the complete opposite. People had no idea, though. After the war ends, on the other hand, that's when people realize the price that had to be paid to achieve victory. And that's why no one in Hanoi who lived through the war, no one in northern Vietnam, or southern Vietnam for that matter, who lived through the war, celebrates April 30th. That means nothing to them because the cost was so great. But again, that slays one, right? Guys don't go to fight because they want to. They go and fight because they have to, because their leaders force them to. It was the case for the Americans, it was the same thing here. But here, because of the nature of the system, the whole narrative of the war can be controlled. And that precluded dissent to some degree within northern Vietnam, and it allowed Hanoi to keep its people under this illusion that the struggle was going really, really well, and that we weren't suffering a whole lot, which only made it easier to draft more men and send them to the south without protest from the men themselves or their their, their families uh, along the same lines, right? From, from again, before the war against the Americans begins, those guys have established a police state that, 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 that will very successfully deter any forms of dissension or otherwise silence dissent whenever it starts to, to, to appear. Uh, and they're, they're very, very good at launching these so-called counter-revolutionary campaigns by, by, by going after these real and imagined enemies across, across the North. And you know, as, you, as some of you might know, right, the, the, the time of the US intervention in Vietnam, uh, really, really bad, bad time in the socialist camp because of the Sino-Soviet dispute. Right? The Soviets, the Chinese are going at it. Uh, they actually go to war against, against each other in 69. And, and I mean, that could have been potentially disastrous for Hanoi. As it turns out, Hanoi, manipulates the Sino-Soviet dispute and, and, and gets even more aid than it would have under normal circumstances. The, the Soviet Union never wanted a big war in Vietnam. The Soviets remembered the, uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. The last thing they wanted to do was for the Vietnamese to wage war in Vietnam and provoke the Americans and create an Asian Missile Crisis. But then, but then Hanoi does what it does. War breaks out in 65. The Chinese commit massive assistance to Hanoi. Hanoi turns to the Soviets. Look, all the Chinese are doing is supporting us. You guys aren't doing anything. It's looking bad. It looks like the Chinese are winning the dispute. The Soviets respond in kind, and Hanoi manages to successfully wage war against the US in both the South using Chinese guns and in the North using hardware provided by the Soviet Union. So the leadership knows people are dying, right? Uh, Tet, 40,000 dead. The spring offensive, the Easter offensive, another 40,000 dead. But I mean, to their credit, they're willing to tolerate those, those, those losses. Make what you want of this. They're not animals, but, but again, I, largely informed by what happened in the war against France and the premature end of the war against France that, that, that further delayed the, the, the reunification of Vietnam, they think that, that, that whatever price needs to be paid, they'll, they'll assume it, right? So, so Jack Kennedy, right, pay any, pay any price, bear any burden. Those guys meant it literally. And, and, and they, they paid that price. The thing is, people themselves don't become aware of it until after it's all over, um, which is why Liz Wan is a really reviled figure in Vietnam today. Uh, people hate him. People really don't like him. They don't like talking about him, even though everybody knows that, that he's the guy who's responsible for the ultimate victory. And, and, and you know, all things being equal, those guys outplayed and outsmarted their American counterparts. You know, I mean, brilliant as, as Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and their, their advisors were, those guys in Hanoi proved even smarter. 
they, 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 again, they weren't peasants, they weren't, they weren't rudimentary thinkers. These are guys who knew exactly what was happening in the Cold War, who knew exactly what was happening in the United States, right? I was, as was mentioned this morning, every major decision, 64 deploy northern troops to the south, 68 Tet Offensive, 72 Spring Offensive, that coincides with a presidential election in the U.S. They're playing the American calendar. They understand the American political system, and, and, and they do whatever they must to win in the end. So, so, so you know, again, right, right we're talking about, about a group of individuals who are committed revolutionaries, but also really, really smart and clever revolutionaries. And, and, and the, the failure of American leaders to understand who these guys were, I think, to some degree or to a large degree accounts for the outcome of, of the war. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just get my water. Thank you, Pierre, for a great introduction, really, for some of us to the North Vietnamese structure of strategy and how it operated during the war. We now have about 20 minutes for questions, and what I'd like you all to do is there's a microphone at either side of the stage. If you have a question, please come up to the microphone so we can capture your comments, and I'll try and moderate and send it to the right uh, participant here. First question. So let, let me start with one while you come to the microphone. Uh, Pierre, let me start with you. Uh, you described the uh, North Vietnam's strate strategy of getting support from both China and Russia and manipulating that relationship to maximize it. How important was it for North Vietnam to have those two powers as nominal allies in pursuing their war effort? It, it, it's absolutely critical. They, they, they don't have the guns, they don't have the technology, they, they've, they've got the manpower, but they, and, 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 and they've got the experience, but they don't have the hardware to match the Americans and, and their allies. And so, so as much as they hate to admit it, there was, there, was, there was great dependence on, on, on uh, military, and, but, but also other supplies from, from, from the socialist camp and from the Soviet Union and, and China in particular. Great. Sir, first question. Yeah, so the question is, uh, I guess between the two of you, and is we've had a general discussion about uh, um, these two strategies now, uh, complaints about American political strategy, uh, American military strategy, and perception. And now looking on the other side of, of this strategy, which is very self-aware. Well, if Americans aren't aware of this, this certainly seems to be that the complaint about the American military strategy at least intuits what its enemy strategy is. So the complaint that says, I'm not being politically supported, I'm not being economically supported, and I'm not, I, I'm rightly not allowed not to care about life. Um, and so in these three complaints, we find at least American dissatisfaction uh, from the soldiers in the war effort and American dissatisfaction on one side of its political perspective with the war effort. So how much of this is really not understood by American leaders or how much of this is complaint to actual understanding of the opposition strategy and its inability because it's not allowed or how much of this is just intuition because I'm a good soldier, I know what I'm doing if I'm allowed to also be a good soldier in these same ways? I mean, it's it, 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 a great question, and I think it's, uh, uh, if you have to look at the uh, chief failing in the war at the very beginning, and uh, to be frank, a lot of the chief failing of historians since the war uh, the, is the constant use of the word American. Uh, th this was essentially a Vietnamese civil war that a Vietnamese side was going to win or not. And the Americans could certainly abet one side winning. There's no doubt about that. But it was not our war to win, and frankly, it wasn't our war to lose either. And uh, uh, if, if, if we didn't even know who we were fighting against, the South Vietnamese didn't know who led them most of the time. But the South Vietnamese have the opposite problem. 
uh, we, we didn't understand the Vietnamese nature of this war, and I think that's a uh, big problem. And it's actually, frankly, a big problem I'm sitting on this stage, that the, um, that the uh, history of the South Vietnamese side of the war is so, is not enough people writing it. The, 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 the book that has me sitting here came out in 2007. There needs to be a lot more books that delve into the Vietnamese nature of this war and kind of bring that into the Americanness of the war. Uh, its Vietnamese nature is badly undersold and understood. No, I, I think that, that, that point really needs to, to, to be stressed, that, that, that th this is a civil war context. Um, and, and, and for the U.S. to intervene in that context, I think, made things very difficult for, 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 for Washington policymakers. And in a way, right, I mean, in a civil war context, U.S. intervention kind of helped delegitimize the regime in, in, in Saigon and really played into Hanoi's own propaganda that we're nobody's lackeys. Great. Sir. Yeah, I just wanted to um, commend both of you for, um, you know, what you presented to us, and, and I can confirm a number of things. Like, I, in terms of the North's information campaign, uh, there was once, when I was in the field, uh, the NVA VC group came into a small village, took it over, and they had loudspeakers, and they talked all about the U.S. elections coming up and how the war was so unpopular in the U.S. It was amazing. Um, and also, uh, I did have some um, work with the P PF forces sometime, and they were, they were pretty good. We had, in one, one village, uh, uh, the commander had parachuted into Dan Van Phu, so he was a tough guy. And then there was another commander who was, was really doing a good job, and the NBA VC assassinated him. So that's, that's what I saw. And it, it it's right an oddity of the war and, and, and our understanding of it that the, uh, as, as heretical as this is going to sound, the RFPF do the heaviest fighting. They take the heaviest losses, and just nobody understands or writes about them at all. Yeah. Andy, let me uh, ask you to follow up and then we'll come back over here. Uh, Pierre has presented a pretty persuasive case for the political leadership and strategic direction of the war in the North. Would you comment a little bit about the South Vietnamese strategic direction of the war? Uh, to use a Mississippi term, totally jacked up. They, uh, <laughs> uh, they, they spent more time uh, trying to figure out who was in control. Uh, uh, and as I said in the paper, they provide no, I mean, the, the, the only uh, unifying policy they had was a really odd European notion called personalism, and that was only under CM. After that, it's people at the top fighting for the scraps of what's left over, and they provide they don't provide this national call to arms. That is the thing that arguably makes the North win. And as I pointed out in my paper, I, I honestly think that there, were, there was enough support in the South to where if there was a unifying uh, idea, uh, who knows what could have happened. So I think it's tragic that they don't come up with that idea. And again, part of that too is the fact they know they can do everything wrong they want to and we're gonna save them. Uh, the, the, there, there is that, especially at the upper echelons, the idea of, well, the Americans are going to win the war for us, so why do we need to uh, get our house of cards in order? So everything North Vietnam has, South Vietnam will lax, totally. Yeah, that's quite a point. Sir? To what extent did the 1972 detente between China and the U.S. influence the North Vietnamese to agree to a negotiated settlement? It was huge. It was really, really big. So, so nothing comes out of it, right? So, so the idea is that the Chinese get Taiwan back, and then, and then in return, uh, uh, the Chinese are supposed to pressure Hanoi into signing an agreement. The Chinese ne ne never, never pressure Hanoi to do anything. But just the, the idea of Nixon then going to China made them really, really nervous. And then he goes to, to the Soviet Union. And, and that anxiety eventually compels them to more seriously consider a diplomatic settlement, which they then signed in January 1973, and which, again, they never wanted to do. But, but detente was really, really big in terms of eventually convincing Hanoi that maybe, just maybe, they should try and get the Americans out diplomatically before resuming fighting. Okay. Sir. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'll address this to both the doctors. Uh, I think it crosses paths. Um, it has to do with uh, Commerce Secretary uh, Lejuan, uh, his uh, Tet Offensive. What he told his people, his, the NVA and the Viet Cong especially, I read memoirs of the Viet Cong, and uh, they thought that the, if I'm not wrong, they, they were told by the communist leadership that this was a campaign to go in, kill the sympathizers with, execute the sympathizers, which I worked with the 52nd Arvins, I was a Viet Vietnamese interpreter, Marine, uh, in the TOR west of Da Nang. Uh, they told them that they, uh, they were to, uh, that the population would, would rise up with them. Now, uh, I don't think later on really believed that. Uh, I, I, I wonder if he did. He, afterwards, he said, well, if the Americans had realized that uh, in his memoirs, that I understand, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, that, that, he, that would have meant defeat for them. I hate to do what ifs, but the Arvin forces did very well that day, uh, that month. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if Lejeune was really, uh, why, why is he the good guy and a Marine rifleman of the bad guy? I don't understand this. So, so Lejeune is really, he was, he, so technically he wins the war, but, but he makes at the cost of making several mistakes, right? So in 64, when he decides to send North Vietnamese troops to the south, he thinks that the Americans won't respond right away and they can win before they respond. Turned out to be wrong. 68 death. He really believed that if we strike in the cities forcefully, the people will realize that the Americans and their allies will never win, they'll rise and then will prevail. He was wrong again. 72 Easter Offensive, he concludes that the Americans are out, that, that, that we can launch this big push using, using armor and we'll win wrong again. And, that, and that's, so what's really remarkable is just how often he's wrong how many lives are lost because he's wrong, and yet the fact that they prevail in the end. And, and that's why I think the diplomatic aspect of things uh, becomes, becomes, become, becomes relevant. But yeah, I'm, I'm not saying he's, he's, he's a good guy or a bad guy. I'm just saying that when you try to understand why the other side fought the way it did for as long as it did, he's the key to all of this. Because most people doing the fighting just want to go home, right? It, it, I mean, once in a while, you might have an American who loves being in Vietnam and killing people. You might have had that on the North Vietnamese side also. But ultimately, most of these guys want this to end. But, but, but Lay's one makes them stay to, to the bitter end. So he's an interesting character, right? So, so good or bad, the fact is that he's the guy, I think, most responsible for the war turning out the way it did and lasting for as long as, as it did. Along those lines, uh, I said America had a difficult time understanding Vietnam. The South Vietnamese have a really difficult time understanding us from time to time. The two things that are most mystifying to them is, is why we pull out in 72, uh, that there, or 73, they, they can't quite figure out why that's going on. But the even bigger one ties in with Tet. But we just smashed the enemy forces. As far as they're concerned, now it's time to invade North Vietnam. Now's the time to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail but instead we get Vietnamization and they just can't quite figure that one out at all. So if we didn't understand them, they also didn't understand our political uh, uh, foibles yeah. nearly as well as the North did. And you know, on, on, on debt also, right? So the, the, we, we see, we have the, the documents, the Vietnamese documents on the planning of Tet. So, so they want Tet to be a military victory. Tet is a military campaign meant to deliver military goals. The re, so that fails, but then there's that reaction in the US, right? which then makes Hanoi look like a bunch of geniuses, but nowhere in their, in their plans does it say that that's the effect they're going for. They want to score that military victory and that political victory in, in Vietnam. Everything else that actually happens in the U.S. afterwards allowed them to, what's the, snatch, defeat, whatever that, but anyway, turn that defeat into a big victory. Yeah. Out of the charge. Yeah. Andy, would you comment on what the South Vietnamese were thinking uh, during and after Tet? Because they do fight pretty well. What was their reaction to the fighting? It, it, arguably, there's two things they see as their big victories. One is Tet, and the other one is the, uh, uh, the destruction of the uh, uh, Easter Offensive of 1972. And in both occasions, they see 
uh, those as harbingers of the future. Perhaps now, uh, of course, it was all, not, not all uh, books portray it that way, but certainly the uh, Vietnamese that, that I've been um, uh, interviewing and dealing with uh, see, see those as again a, a, a national chance to to kind of get things right, as it were. In '72, they're very cognizant of the fact that we're leaving and it might be too late to achieve something that's sustainable. But in 68, they really believe there's a sustainable victory to be seen there because, of course, the American reaction to Tet hasn't really taken place yet. The, the country's kind of 180 on the war hasn't, hasn't really shifted into place yet, which totally, just utterly mystifies them, that they can't understand how the American president can have a military victory over here and yet have it snatched away politically at home, that they're uh, unaware of how something like that could happen. Great. Sure. Given the hindsight of 50 years, uh, is there any possibility in the fantasy scenario that if the U.S. had backed the other side, given the geopolitics, uh, would there be any difference in Vietnam today? I. So I, 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 I don't think it would have been possible, right? I mean, because Vietnam, for, for, the, for the Americans, it's never about Vietnam. It's about, it's about the Cold War, right? And, and the idea of, of, of failing to assist the South. I don't see how Johnson can survive without, without doing what, what, what he does. You know, it's, it's easy now to say, oh, you know, the U.S. should have never gotten in. But, but at the time, I mean, I mean no one would have, would have, would have done, done otherwise. To me, the, the critical point is 4950. When the Americans decide to start supporting the French, that's when they, they buy Vietnam. And, and from that moment on, it's, it's, I think it's impossible for the U.S. to kind of extricate itself without losing credibility to such a degree that it hurts America's chances of sustaining the Cold War and eventually winning it. Great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Pierre, you kind of took the, um, you, you took my question away. <laughs> I'm a class of 1968 from VMI, and a special meaning for me being here, because I was the only member of my class to graduate mid-semester in the middle of the Tet Offensive and went to the 82nd. But my question is this, uh, for either one of you, um, I have read and heard, and it's back to what was just said, that early on there were some feelers from North Vietnam, from Ho Chi Minh and others to the U.S. to, to perhaps support their movement and Harry Truman was yeah. determined to support the French uh, for, for NATO in Europe. Any thoughts about that? Thank you. So, uh, in the, so as you know, right, Ho Chi Minh was in Paris during the Versailles talks in 1919, and then he writes to Truman in 45, and again in 46, please help us, we just want independence. He's playing the Americans. I mean, he knows exactly what he's doing, but he knows in 45, 46, right, he doesn't want the French to return, he knows the French will try to return. He knows in, he's in no position to stop them, but the Americans are. So, so, so these, these feelers are sent out, uh, but, but it's really kind of to, to get the Americans to tell the French to not come back, but that wouldn't have changed anything. I mean, I mean, Ho Chi Minh was going to turn whatever portion of Vietnam into, into a, a fully functional socialist state. Um, if I, that answers your, your question. Yeah. Sure. Uh, in light of your study of North Vietnam, uh, have you run across, in light of uh, the Jane Fonda and John Kerry's Winter Soldiers and the SDS and et cetera, the anti-war movement in the United States, any outside influence on the anti-war movement by North Vietnam, China, Russia? So, so in the archives in Hanoi, so I, I found this file. It, it, it's a, so whoever wanted to go to North Vietnam during the war had to apply through a mission, right? either a Viet Cong mission or a North Vietnamese mission overseas. And then Hanoi would study your application and they would study you. And, and there was this, this great one, this guy was a professor at Berkeley, right? And he'd written a couple of anti-war pieces and, and, and the recommendation from the mission where he submitted the application was that don't, don't bother bringing, he's, he's a little guy. The foreign ministry goes, well, he's a professor and last semester he taught three classes in one of his class, he had 200 students. So if we bring him over, 
we have the potential for him to be in class, badmouth the war to 400 students per semester, assuming the war goes on for another three years. So, I mean, everything is calculated. Everything down, down to where those guys go when they get to, to Hanoi. So, so, so there, there's, 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 it's all part of this diplomatic struggle, right, to sway, to sway opinion. Andy, I'd, I'd like to ask, this, this brings up the point, and I think that's been made, but I'd like you to perhaps expand upon the role of the Americans and the South Vietnamese coordinating a narrative of their own to comp counteract the North Vietnamese disinformation and propaganda. Do you see any evidence of that happening? Uh, frankly, no. The, the, uh, the, the Americans, uh, the, there were uh, wonderful uh, uh, relationships between individual advisors and their counterparts, but frankly there was, uh, the, the, that I'd be able to find no coordination at all between the, the uh, U.S. at the very top and the Vietnamese at the very top. They're, they're quite often at each other's throats about things like strategy and about how best to proceed. Um, the, the, the South Vietnamese military is constantly asking for a bigger role to play, uh, perhaps knowing that at some point this is going to be their war to take over. And uh, arguably, as it was brought up earlier, when the command changes from Westmoreland to, to Abrams, Abrams gives this better lip service. But if you're looking at you know, what actually happens, uh, the li it's lip service is often just that. Westmoreland, uh, 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 Professor Dadis is around here somewhere. Westmoreland and Abrams both often gave really good lip service to this idea, but how far it penetrated down into the command structure was often very, very questionable. Um, so there, there isn't this joint idea. Uh, we're two armies fighting side by side as opposed to a, a unified force kind of fighting together. Uh, much unlike the Korean experience, which, which had been perhaps very instructive to what we perhaps should have done in Vietnam. Great. Sir, I cut you off. Do you, can you ask a question from there loud enough? close to wiping them out in terms of manpower? I mean, could they have sustained another million, for example? I mean, that's kind of ridiculous, but where, where were we there? And, and the reason I ask that is, in May of 69, I was in a, an engagement with North Vietnamese, and none of them surrendered. But there was one guy that was wounded we picked up and brought back. And I heard later from the S2 they couldn't shut this guy up because he'd been indoctrinated and told that when he was captured, he, he better take a bullet and be captured. And he just hold on. Anyway, 18 years old, came down the trail, plugged into an NVA division. So where was the bottom of the well? Is the question. I I I I don't know. I mean, I don't. But there's no indication whatsoever that manpower was ever a concern for 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 Hanoi, even even after 68, 69. So in the south, there's there, there's issues, right? Among the Viet Cong after Tet. A lot of the Viet Cong units, to be functional, have to be replenished with northern soldiers. But northern Vietnamese units, there, there's no evidence whatsoever that, 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 they, they're, they're, that let's say, if another Tet Offensive, then the U.S. would have, would have, would have won. They start, you know, they start bringing in more Catholics into the North Vietnamese Army, which they were always reluctant to, to allow in, more ethnic minorities, right? So, so there are some strains, but, but there's no indication that that, that. The end was not in sight. <laughs> no. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please give our panelists a, a hand.